Um, so, uh, hello everybody. Um, just so you guys know, I've if anybody signed up to our TMM website, whether they're paid members or not, the past couple of classes I've been inviting everybody. Um, but these trainings here are really uh, part of our membership program that we provide for 25 bucks a month. Uh, I'm not trying to shill for money, but when Brandon and I first started this uh, this channel, I mean, he had his and I had mine and we joined together. I was very adamant about putting commercials on the videos that I post on YouTube. And it's not like we're making much money. I'm lucky if we get $100 a month from the, all the videos that are up there right now. But um, we're just trying to compensate the cost for all the time and stuff that Brandon and I put up. Uh, we're not trying to get rich, but... Uh, you know, some of these things, uh, we do have to get a little bit of a salary. Some of that money that we collect helps pay for the school that we have for the hands-on training. Um, because we only hold a couple of classes a year. That doesn't really cover the cost of the warehouse and everything else. So we're just trying to work things out. But just give you guys a heads up on that. Um, once in a while, I will invite anybody who has gone to TMM and just signed up, not even paid or not. So those classes you guys if you do get an invitation you're you're always welcome to come um, but we don't want people who are paid members to feel like well why am I paying if other people are coming in and they're not paid members either but um, a lot of these videos I'm trying to get together a lot of material I'm, I've been writing this uh, class on, on schematics to where you could go through online and go through it on your own and some of the books I sent some of you last week uh, was some of the material I pulled from and then some of my own material, I drew my own diagrams, made my own images and stuff like that. So it's taken me a lot of time to do, but just so you know, that's going to be a part of the online training uh, that we're going to have for all machines, but it's very difficult being the only one who writes and I own a business, I teach at night full time at a school and then I do this TMM thing and just finding spare time is very difficult. So um, let's go over. Uh, this refrigerator so you guys can see my screen let me see uh, what I see is the Frigidaire one what image do you guys see in the Frigidaire diagram with a refrigerator on it yeah, yeah I'm seeing a Frigidaire with a like this. okay I'm gonna stop because I'm trying to share my whole window and not an actual um, uh, here I think Hmm. Well, well, I might have to switch back and forth, but so right now I'm switching to the GE one. A lot of you guys don't have this diagram, but Ali's with us today, and he brought up a question about a defrost thermostat um, that said 140 degrees on it. And if we go, hmm, how do I how do I switch back and forth? So if we go here, let me let me switch windows again. I'm sorry. Gotta figure out a way that I can. Okay, here we go. Entire screen. That's what I want to do. Okay, so now you guys should be seeing this defrost thermostat. And um, this defrost thermostat was from a GE. Um, Ali brought it up, and I, I sort of figured it out after talking to somebody. Um, him and I went back and forth a couple times. Um, and we were talking about the temperature a defrost thermostat runs at. Now I'll get into the diagram part in just a minute. I just wanted to clarify a few things about this, which was on the last video as well. Um, this thermostat here, the 50X10065, if we look right here, and I'll zoom in even more if you guys can't see it, because if you're using like a mobile phone or something, it says L140 minus 30. And whenever you see a, any type of thermostat that's got an L in front of it, that means it's limit. And yes, the limit on that thermostat is 140 degrees. But this would be what you would call a defrost thermostat. And if we go to the schematic here, one second, let me bring up the schematic. If we look at this schematic here, you can see this circuit for the defrost heater here coming off the board and um, with this defrost heater we have this 
over temperature thermostat that opens at 140 degrees and see it says closes at, closes at 110 and if we go back to, to here it opens at 140 this minus 30 so whenever you see a thermostat it's got two different sets of numbers the high number is the number that that thermostat usually opens at and the lower number is you minus this number from that higher number and that is when the thermostat's going to close. So if we go back to the schematic that I had here, it opens at 140 and if we take away 30 that's where it closes at 110. So unlike most defrost thermostats, if you own this one out, like you just took it out of the package, it's most likely uh, going to be what? Open or closed. What do you guys think about that? Closed. It's going to be closed. It says closed at 110, but it closes at any temperature uh, oh. lower than 110. It'll open at 140. So if you had it in your truck at 80, 90 degrees, uh, this thermostat would be closed. And yes, Peter, you're correct. Um, so this is not a true defrost thermostat because a true defrost thermostat is to shut the heater off before we get so hot we damage food and, and overheat the freezer. So this is only there as a safety device. So what happened is looking at the uh, thermistors here, we have a couple of thermistors on the refrigerator. We have two in the fridge in the fresh food section, fr fresh food one, fresh food two. We have a thermistor in the freezer and we have an evaporator thermistor. So the evaporator thermistor, this is located right on the evaporator in the freezer. And the evaporator thermistor is what's controlling the defrost heater. So it, it, it not just used to shut the heater off at a high temperature, but it's also monitoring the evaporator temperature. I've mentioned, I think in I think it was a Samsung video that uh, in some of the training that I've been in that they actually use that evaporator thermistor to determine if you had a sealed system problem inside the refrigerator. Because when you turn the refrigerator on, it takes a few minutes for the evaporator to build up what we call the frost pattern and build up ice on the evaporator. And the thermistor would always be located, just like a defrost thermostat, somewhere near the suction line which is the very very end of the evaporator so that is going to take the longest to get like frost built up on it or, or the temperature that we want and they use that to say well if the compressor turns on on a refrigerator it takes so much time for a frost pattern to appear on the evaporator and if I don't see a frost pattern build up in that much time I might have a Freon problem even if the evaporator fan's not working, the freon's going to flow through the evaporator. So the ther thermistor evaporator is there, one, to say, hey, we're in defrost, and when we get to enough temperature and, and melt the ice, and, and like the other thermostats we talked about, 47 degrees is about the average temp of a defrost thermostat, um, this unit's going to tell the board, hey, shut the heater off. Now, the other thing is, is it could be used on some manufacturers like you know, GE is very, very strongly related to LG in some of their manufacturing. So uh, some of these ideas may be coming from other manufacturers as well. Um, but going to the uh, going to the defrost circuit, this thermostat here would only be if that thermistor or the board failed to tell the heater to come off. So this over temperature thermostat, even though like a most defrost thermostats it's located in series with this heater and its job is to shut the heater off at right temperature this one is hey if we go into defrost and I don't see that thing shut off this one's gonna prevent it from overheating and, and then the second question was well can I just put a 47 degree thermostat in um, I thought about that I said yes and technically you could you could put a, a uh, 47 degree thermostat in there and that heater would work just like any other defrost circuit but also think about this 
if this refrigerator came with 140 degree and you see they even post it right on the schematic and you put a 47 degree if something happened because of that defrost circuit you put in a part that doesn't meet the specs of the original design of the manufacturer and you could open yourself up to a liability if a fire happened or something and that thermostat failed so in this case yeah you could put it and it probably wouldn't affect anything it would probably defrost like normal but because you're not putting a GE part that's at the same setting that the factory put in now you open yourself up to liabilities now if you went to a refrigerator and it had a 47 degree thermostat and you put a different brand 47 degree thermostat that's probably not going to be a problem but if you go from a 140 and you go ahead and you put in a 47 degree thermostat in there and something happens with that circuit now you open yourself up to possible scrutiny so uh, I do want to make sure that you guys are all aware of it that yeah you can put any door switch on a dryer you can put any thermostat on a dryer um, as long as the temperatures are in range on the thermostats and stuff like that but be very careful uh, if you're going to go to something where it says 140 and you go ahead and change it to a totally different temperature setting so uh, I really didn't want to go over this schematic today and I didn't provide it to you guys but um, I just wanted to bring that up did anybody have any questions about that okay good now I showed uh, Evelio, my student, just the other day we were talking about a schematic and Admiral has a built-in resistor to their defrost thermostat. I know I wanted to cover over this refrigerator but I just wanted to go over um, one second it just came to my head so I want to see if I can find it uh, Yeah, I got it right here. One second. Let me bring this in the screen. Thanks to my buddy Samurai here. Uh, he's, he's always got almost every diagram you can imagine. For some reason, it doesn't want to open. So I'm just going to bring it over here. I know it's going to be a little hard. I'm going to try to zoom in on it. Uh, man, that's going to be hard to see. Let me see if I can find a, another, another image. Just a little bit better. Um... So Admiral, this one here might, here we go, apply intelligence again. So Admiral uh, did something a little bit different. So I want you guys to see this, the fact that we're talking about refrigerators and the, uh, and the defrost circuit. Can you guys see this defrost thermostat right here? Yes. Okay. If you look, that that thermostat's actually two parts. The very top like curve that goes between the dots here, I know I can't zoom in much more, the computer's, you know what, wait, I think I can using my, my magnifier tool, hold on, there we go, that might be better. Um, so the top part of this is the actual bimetal, that is the switch that opens and closes, but look what we have here. What does that symbol look like on the bottom, just above my mouse here? Resistance resistance and look what it says in the box for diagnostic continuity check 240,000 ohms what the heck so what's what's the average resistance of a defrost heater anybody know uh, a heater uh, it's about 30 ohms okay just on average, even like a stove heating element or bake element, they're 20, 30 ohms, something like that. So if I go to this Admiral refrigerator and I want to check it for defrost, and I turn this timer here so it closes contact 1 to 2 and sends power to my heater, and it's not getting hot, and, and the customer's evaporator is all frozen up. Well, it could be a heater, or it could be a bimetal. So where would we test 
those components uh, without having to tear the whole freezer apart because remember it's going to be all frozen with ice so uh, where are we going to test those pin two and three pin two and three on the timer two here and three here and if we look that goes this way comes right back through to pin two so a defrost heater is supposed to be 30 ohms so if the heater is good and the bimetal is good this switch here is closed and that switch when it's closed will read zero ohms so if both components are good and I go to pin two and three and ohm it out I'll get a 30 ohm resistance but what if the heaters broken what kind of reading would I get 240k no because if the heaters oh. broken no. I won't zero have it. L. I'll have infinity. Zero L. O L on a digital or the squiggly eight sideways uh, uh, infinity means an open line. Um, but if the bimetal switch is open, I'll get 240 plus 30 ohms, so 240,030 ohms. <laughs> um, but what that would tell me is like on a regular refrigerator if the heaters open or the bimetals open if I measure from here I don't know which one is the bad part I'd have to order both and go back when I go to change them to manually test which one is bad and only change that one but this one here if I get 240,000 ohms it's telling me my heaters good the defrost thermostats open so by putting that extra resistor in there that allowed a technician to determine whether it's a defrost thermostat or a defrost heater. I just wanted to bring that up, that Maytag and, and Admiral had put that in refrigerators for several years, and it just that's what this 240,000 diagnostic check is. So, any okay. questions on that before we go on to the actual class for today? So those uh, refrigerators that use regular 47 uh, degrees Fahrenheit uh, thermostats. Do they use those thermostats for defrost control or do they also use thermistors? Um, well, this refrigerator is using a thermistor for defrost control and using a defrost thermostat as a safety backup. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I still don't know why they went as high as 140 degrees, but just think if if for some reason your thermistor is not sensing the right temperature every time this unit went into defrost, it's going to open up that heater at 140 degrees. And that's going to cause all kinds of problems because with that kind of heat, you're going to create excess moisture and steam throughout the freezer um, and you might cause other problems. Uh, but I guess they didn't want it close to the cycling temperature so that the board can control the cycling because if, if the defrost thermostat opens before this sensor, let, let me zoom out just a little bit here, if, oh they're, they're all the way down there, but if, if this evaporator thermistor cycles at 45 degrees, 47 degrees, whatever, uh, and you say, well, why can't I put a 47 degree in there? Because the thermistor is still going to shut it off. Um, remember, that thermistor is monitoring a lot of things. It's monitoring actually how long does it go into defrost. Where, let's say we got just this circuit here. We got a heater and a thermostat that opens at 47 degrees. The board can, they could put logic in the board that would measure the amperage draw of this to see if the heater's on and off like an ammeter or an ampro. But they really don't know how long does it actually take to defrost because the defrost cycle's 22 minutes, but the refrigerator may defrost in 10 or 12 minutes and the other eight minutes it's just sitting there without the heater being on before it goes back into cooling. So. The refrigerator doesn't really monitor this circuit whether it's on or off. It does turn it on, but it goes on and off by this evaporator thermistor. So it can adjust how long it takes to defrost based on how long the sensor in the freezer tells it, okay, we're at the right temperature. 
you know, let, let's, let's move on from there. Um, so, it remember, when they added these boards, they went into what we call adaptive defrost. Adaptive defrost allows the computer board to change how many times a day it'll defrost and how much time the actual defrost cycle is. If it could defrost in eight minutes, it's going to shut the heater off. It still wait a few minutes before it goes back into cooling, um, but it may only make the defrost cycle 10, 10, 15 minutes instead of 22 minutes like a mechanical timer. So again, we're not going to be in defrost if we don't need to be, but when we come out of defrost, a lot of manufacturers don't want that heater to be on and then immediately go right into cooling. What, what happens back there is when you're defrosting, all the moisture's coming off the evaporator and turn into humidity in the air. And then if you go right into cooling, the evaporator fan's gonna suck all that moisture up into the air and blow that right over the top of your packages. So if you, if you ever had like a, a like chicken or steak in a fridge that had that clear plastic from the grocery store and you had all this white snowy frost on it, you can't really see the meat. And some of that could happen from either warm air migrating into the box and then freezing on top, or the defrost cycle making excessive moisture back there and then just blowing it right on top of these packages and they're so cold, it starts frosting up and now you can't see your food. So manufacturers want, when it finishes a defrost cycle, it still wants it to sit a few minutes back there and go into cooling after the cold air sort of like recondensed that humidity and moisture so it doesn't blow it over the box. Amana had the evaporator fan connected to the defrost thermostat. So when we went into defrost and when we came out of defrost the compressor came on and the condenser fan came on but the fan in the freezer did not come on because the defrost thermostat was open. and it would run and the evaporator itself would get cold from the compressor pumping Freon in it. This thermostat would close and it would engage the evaporator fan at that point. I remember one time I went to a customer's house and they said, oh, my refrigerator's not cooling. I go to the freezer, fan's not working. I see the compressor and condenser fan are working. So, if we, I mean, if we look at this refrigerator, if the compressor and the condenser fans are working and the evaporator fan's not working, this one didn't have that full computer system in it. I said, oh, I'm just, I'm gonna go get an evaporator fan. I go out to my truck, I get a fan. I go back in, I open up the door, I start pulling it apart, and halfway to pull it apart, the fan turns on. And I'm thinking, what the heck? I thought it was a loose connection or something. Look at the schematic and found out that when you come out of defrost, this defrost thermostat also controls the evaporator fan motor. So a lot of manufacturers do uh, different things. Let me just see if I can I'm just going to see if I can find an Amana refrigerator diagram to show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, I think this might be it right here. Yep. Let me just bring this one into view here guys. And let's just take a look at this diagram right here. Uh, it was in that other image. Let me just, let's go here, this, this diagram right here. If you guys look at this diagram on the right, I'll zoom in with my magnifier here so you guys can see it. If you look here, this is the cooling cycle. We send power here and the evaporator fan. This defrost thermostat here on, it's not it's not like that on this one here if the evaporator fan uh, if, if this thermostat was uh, open the fan would come on I just looked at it closely and it that's not the right one I'm sorry I apologize Let's see if I can find it okay here this one might have it yeah okay this one has the one I want you to see let's take a look at it now if you look at the evaporator fan right here, look, it goes in series with your defrost thermostat. So when we're in defrost, this control is going to send power here. It's going to come in and go through the, this 
pin connection to the thermostat here and up to the heater for defrost. Now we're in defrost, the, the, the heat's going to open up that thermostat and the heater's going to shut off. Now we're going to go into cooling. So what happens is this particular switch is going to close. Uh, wait, wait, was that? Okay, that was defrost. So now this switch is in cooling. We're going to send power here to our evaporator fan. No, that's not our circuit either. Let me see something here. Okay, here's here's our circuit. I, I let me copy this and put it where I can I can draw it. I'm tr I'm trying to. I see it so small on my computer, guys. It's it's hard to follow that circuit. Here we go. Copy. And let me bring it in where I can uh, show it to you. I'll just put it right over top of here. Okay, so now it's a little bit easier for you guys to see and me to read. So watch this. Power comes in here. Refrigerator. This is your your refrigerator thermostat closes, and now. We're going to send power here to our evaporator fan. And our evaporator fan is going to go this way. And where does it go? It goes right through the defrost thermostat. Now, when the thermostat closes, the fan will run. And their logic behind that is to prevent frost from building up on food when, when it goes into cooling. So if you go into an, a MANA refrigerator and you see your evaporator fan's not working, make notice that they do this with their defrost thermostats so you don't want to just go right oh it's bad fan motor you know the compressor's running and if the compressor's running i know we're in cooling and the condenser fans running my evaporator fan all three of these should be always running at the same time well good the evaporator fan won't run if the defrost thermostats open so again i'm sorry i, I got sidetracked because i wanted to talk about this but then all these other things came up a lot of manufacturers do some different things and you got to be able to see these parts on the diagram and see how they do this and this a mana diagram maybe uh, my next lecture I might go a little bit deeper into this schematic a little bit more about um, why they do what they do on these units here any questions on this one no so that's the okay. time delay Fan delay bypass. That's where you can measure the voltage on on your on your fan. You can measure voltage, but that's not the fan. That's across what the defrost thermostat. So you could ohm out your defrost bimetal from there, almost like the Whirlpool has that test plug to check the bimetal, or you could jump it and then see if the fan comes on, knowing your defrost thermostat is why your fan's not working. All right. So that's what I would use it for. So if I put a little jumper here and my fan wasn't working and then all of a sudden my fan came on, so then I know what? The fan's going like this. And then what's it doing? It's in series with the defrost heater. And it it uses the heater as a path. Okay? So let's get into the actual diagram that we came here for. This, the refrigerator diagram that I sent to you all. This was also known as refrigerator one. Uh, the model number of the refrigerator is here at the top. It's a side-by-side -side refrigerator. I tried to get something that's not too complicated. But one thing I want to break out in the GE1 did the same thing. So let me see, where is that GE diagram again? I had it here before I go into the other one. Um, GE did this as well. If you look at their board, the board is, if you took a line and drew it right down the center of this board, and I'll zoom in in a second, everything on the left hand side is low voltage. Everything on the right hand side, we could call it high voltage or it would be like the, the 120 volts coming in. So if you look, you say, well how do you know that? How do you know that that this evaporator fan's not not low volt, uh, not high voltage? Well, we got 13 volts DC here on the, on this terminal. That's an indication that it's only uh, low voltage. But the other thing is, is it's easy to tell because if the components coming off the board go to your neutral here on the power cord, like your compressor, your defrost heater, or your dispensers, or your water valves, or whatever, all of them go to neutral, then that part of the board is the 110 volt part of the board. 
All of these here, if you look, none of them connect to the neutral. And it also says right here, DC voltage and line voltage. So they broke it down for you on the bottom. Okay, so that's how you know what the voltages are. Now let's get back to the Frigidaire one. The Frigidaire one has the same thing. If I drew a line right down the middle, everything on this side, you could see they're all just connected right off the board. They don't go to any other outside line. Our power cords here and all these components on this side are going to run off of 110 volts. So when you're testing components, you say, well, how do I know what voltage that part's supposed to have? You have to be able to read the schematic and identify that on schematic. Now, I broke this schematic down in, in other parts so you could see it a little better. Um, I just put this here just for informational purposes of what we were working with and so forth. Um, so let's take a look at the board. If we look closer at this plug, you can see there's 5 volts DC and 12 volts DC. Those are the only two voltages that most computer boards on appliances use if it's not 120 volts. 5 volts in DC and 12 volts DC are going to be very common. Now the one thing that makes it difficult is, let me go ahead and zoom in on this on this schematic just for a second here to point something out. I know it's a little blurry but I'm trying to make it bigger. So you see this says 12 volts DC, 5 volt DC, and what's these other two terminals? They're, they're right here at the top. One says GND and one says COMM dot. Is it ground? Ground. Mm -hmm. And what's the other one? Is it common? It could be common or it could be communication. It's most likely common if you have DC volts. You gotta have a plus and a minus. In this case, a lot of times the minuses are called common. So pin three would be five volts, pin four would be 12 volts, and you would put the red meter lead on pin three, and you would use this common for both of them when you're doing the low voltage testing. Now I'm gonna break down what they go to and what it is, but I just want you to look at the board so that you can see what information on the diagram you could use to help test. Now if you look at J6, we have a bunch of plus five DCs. Well, how do we check that voltage? We gotta have a common, right? Would you do the same thing? Touch the A with the common two, I think it is? Wait, 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 say that again now? Okay, so let's just say uh, this, this pin, number 12, is plus five volts DC, okay? But I said in order to check DC voltage, you have to have the positive and the common. So where do I get my common? I only wrote uh, pin 11. Uh, pin 11 would be your common for this one. Pin 5 would be your common for this one. Now, you're like, well, how do you know that? I'll bring that back up when we look at the actual diagram. Because you have to actually see the parts that are coming off that. And I did break it down. But I just wanted you guys to see these things as far as, like, what am I looking at here? And so you got 12 volts DC, 12 volt DC, 5 volts, 5 volts. The opposite pins which are mar not marked are most likely your, your, your negative terminals, okay? Sometimes like this one here, they only had one common with two different positives, but that's okay, okay? Does anybody know what PWM is? Pulse with, uh, pulse with modulation. And what is that? What, what is pulse width modulation? It's controlling the power, uh, basically the voltage to, to the uh, element or whatever. Is that's, that's, usually, that's usually a fan motor or yes, a yes. drive motor. AC voltage, when we look at it, it's in some, some <laughs> called a sine wave. It goes up and down and up and down. A pulse width modulation is, is it comes on to the max 
and it runs at the max voltage for a certain amount of time and then comes down goes to zero volts and it comes back on and goes down uh, you know like like on the merry-go-round as kids you know one person stood there and he kept spinning this thing around and all the other kids are on, on that thing that I don't know what they call that around it's like a merry-go-round but it's the thing in the park where you hang on and everybody tries to throw the kids off <laughs> um, you know you take your hand and you push it and then when you let go you're not pushing it so that's like the minus and then this part here is the voltage applied at the highest voltage which would be 12 volts DC uh, here and so it would be 0 volts and then it will come out for 12 volts for this much time and then shut off and stay off this much time come back on give 12 volts shut off so it, it would pulse the voltage instead of constantly feeding the voltage all the time what's the benefit behind that I don't know because I'm not an engineer I just know that when you're checking voltage there you're not gonna have a constant voltage reading you might see the need the needer jump up and then shut off jump on and shut off but if you see that PWM then you know that's what it's designed to do that's what the board's supposed to do it's supposed to pulse the voltage so um, on this screen, the reason why I, I brought this screen up is I have an actual photograph of the board. The schematic shows the board like this, but this is what your board actually looks like. You have a bunch of connectors here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine connectors here on the board. And there's actually something right here. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, that that's what these plugs J1, J2, J3, J3, J4, and etc. Each one of these would be a J plug. It's very hard to see, but there is a J marking right there. But let's go ahead and go to the next screen. So here's an actual picture. It's in the bottom right hand corner of your schematic that actually showed you the pin locations of those plugs. And remember we when I said here on this one this came off of the schematic let me just do this how many plugs are on this this picture right here how many plugs do we have starting from left to right one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen now we got one two three four five six seven eight nine wow. well let's take a little bit deeper look at that look j3 well oh, that wasn't the color i wanted i wanted yellow hold on look j3 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 all of them are j3 they're all one plug on the board and if we look here, J3 is dude, right here, this plug right here. So that would be this plug. This is J3. And look at the, look at the, uh, look at J3. Let's see, one and two, three, there is no four, five, six, there's no seven or eight, nine, ten. So there's ten pins. If we look at this plug, and I'll go to the other one a little bit easier to read. We look at this plug, start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if you see the diagram, this part right here says J31 and J32. If we go back to this diagram here, let me erase some of this just so we can see it. First of all, where do I put my my meter to check that out on, on this board? I'm on this plug and I want to check J31 and J32, right? J31 and 2 is checking this part. I go to this plug here, where's J31 and 2? On the top? Uh, on the top of the plug? So Yeah, because I see a 1 on top of the JT3. 
So what I highlighted right there is what? What I highlighted right here. Another one. That's pin one, and notice on the board they tell you where pin one is. So why is this one pin here not bold like the others? You see how like they're all black except for this one is white in the middle? I'll make it bigger here, one second. Why why is why is all of these pins black but this one is not? There's not a pin there. Exactly. If you look, there's a, a missing pin on the board. They're not using it. And that's why it's here. What pin would that be? If you were to tell me over the phone, hey, Richard, if you're looking at this board, pin one is on one end. But if you look on the other end, there's a missing pin. That is J3 what? Eight. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is correct. It's plug J3 pin number eight on that plug. So if, if you're going to a schematic and we're going to check, uh, this one isn't the one with the J3. Let's go to where I have J3. I know I had it on here somewhere. But here it is, J3, 1, and 2. I'm checking here. Now, really, I wouldn't probably check those two because this one's sending power out here and this one's sending power out there. One is for the auger motor. That's the motor that pushes the ice out the door. The other one is for whether or not you want crushed or cubed ice. But that's how you find the pin, and that's how you use the diagram, because this diagram here tells you, well, this component here is getting power from J3-2. So I would know where on the board would I put my meter to make that test. Does that make sense? Anybody got any questions on that? Okay, we'll get a little bit deeper in here, because I bro broke all these circuit uh, down. Uh, let's go back to the first one that I have. So this here helps you find whether where pin one is. And in the last lecture, uh, I um, where I talked about the board, I showed you. You can barely see it on here. There is a white number one right there. I don't know if you guys see it. Let me see if I can zoom in out with my magnifier. There's a number one right there. And then if we look at this next plug, there's a number one right there identifying the pin location of those terminals. Now, some of them are not as easy because this one, they're not in any particular order. But if we uh, zoom out here, that four pin plug is what plug on this board? Is it J1? That's J1. Now, which two terminals are bringing power into that board? Because if we look at the schematic here, J1, right? This is the schematic here. I'm going to zoom in. Hold on a second. I'm trying to expand the diagram and then bring the uh, bring it closer. Okay. So J1 is here, and that had four pins, but they weren't in a row like the other one. They were two on top and two on the bottom. They are what bring power into the board. So what two pins do I test? One and three. One and three. One is neutral, and three is line, the power coming in. And this is our plug here in the wall. It doesn't look like it, but that's the plug that's plugged into the wall, bringing power in. So we're going to check one and three, right? So let's zoom out for a second and let's go to here and then if we look one and three are on the bottom and the one thing nice about this image is that this image is drawn the exact way you would see the board if you just rotate them the both the way both the same way one and three is here this is relay one we don't even have relay one on this board do we we have a place for it, but it's not on that board. But one and three is here. This is pin one here, 
right here this is pin one and this is pin three so this diagram is very helpful in one we use the diagram to see where power comes in then we have to find the pin locations on that diagram I could use this image to show me physically on the board where am I going to put my meter so we have to go one to the other to the other and even me with all my experience if I wasn't familiar with looking at the wires and telling you oh, those two are the power coming in I'd have to look at it just the way I'm telling you to have to go to the first diagram we looked at then go to this picture that we're looking at to tell me where are those pins on this board and how to make this test so let's take a little bit closer look now at this board this piece here is a USB connection now LG has those for for the jig and if any of you guys have done a compressor job on an LG refrigerator uh, they've had so many problems with the linear compressors is they kept updating the um, firmware or the programming on the board to meet the new compressor now they've come out with a compressor that's supposed to be like a universal that replaces all these compressors but after you change the compressor you have to plug in a USB device they call it a jig which has updated programming so the new compressor will run so in an LG refrigerator if you change the compressor you either have one of two options either order a new main board for the refrigerator and just replace the board or you plug in this USB device called a jig and you update the software on this jig so that you can create a uh, you know new programming for, for, for the software to run the new compressor now Frigidaire does not have anything like that so they use it mainly probably for actually programming the board from the factory when they're going to put it in a specific refrigerator so that it knows how to run all these devices so let's take a look at some of the circuitry here on the bottom left hand side we have a fresh food door switch and a freezer door switch but we have an auger switch okay so we have three switches on this unit if I wanted to check the freezer door switch how could I test it from the board and I'll bring this diagram in if you guys can't see it freezer door switch how do I test it from the board 12 8 oh j5 12 8 j5 12 j5 8 so we go over here for j5 and j5 is here and this is one two three four five six seven eight is this one so we're going to use this pin let me get my marker here we're going to go here one two three four five six seven eight so it's, it's that pin <laughs> that's too big <laughs> let me undo it here so J58 is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 I'd go here and then 12 is 9 10 11 12 so you see these two pins are the same as these two pins on this board it looks like they're right next to each other but in real life this 8 and 12 are four pins apart now if I want to check the door switch how would I do it and you know exactly what would I do I want to check the door switch I don't think that door switch is working right uh, with the freezer you can measure the resistance okay so we'd unplug it now we've unplugged it we're going to look at the actual plug that goes on the board. It's going to have all these wires coming off of it. We're going to put our meter in the plug, not on the board. If I pull this plug off the board and touch these two pins, I'm checking the board. I'm not checking this switch, and I don't even know what I'm checking if I'm just touching the board. So if I unplug it, 
these wires are what are coming here they're both yellow and pink here and here so I'm going to put my meter on the plug with the wires not on the board to make that test but I can let's say I make that test I unplug it I put my meter lead here on yellow and pink and yellow and pink and I got zero ohms I open the door I got infinity I close it again I got continuity but my refrigerator is still saying door open what do I do now any ideas you can jump it. well you could jump it but you could also see if we got the five volts here right yes yeah, yeah. um, there are there is possibility something on the board is not sending the voltage to read through that switch and then you're saying well wait a minute if I got five volts and I run a jumper here won't I short the board out not really. The 5 volts is almost like your volt, your multimeter. Your multimeter uses a 9 volt battery when it's testing something. So the board is not having plus minus here. It's plus in plus out. There is no plus minus. When will we have a plus minus on the plug? And if you don't understand what I'm saying, say hey, I don't know what you're talking about plus minus. Positive negative. Why, why am I saying this is plus plus and not plus minus? There's no chassis ground. Not that there's no chassis ground. What's it say turn? Okay, Peter says, that's right. Plus minus, you would have a positive and negative if it was a load. Like if it was the fan motor oh, or, okay. or, an oven, or, 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 or the thermistor would have plus minus because it's a resistor that that's going to have a positive negative side but because this is just an open and closed switch would you put a switch on a 120 volt outlet like stick one side of the switch on line one and the other side of the switch on neutral and close the switch you blow it up so in this case when it's just a switch you got power coming in it's going to go through the switch and come right back out to feed the board and the board's going to see that five volts coming back out and saying yeah that door switch is closed let's do its thing you know, I just realized, guys, we're not going to make it through this whole presentation today, so I might even do another class next Saturday to complete this one. I'll go, I'll go to about 1.15, but I have to, I have to do something at 2 o'clock, so uh, i just let you know I apologize. I didn't realize time went by so fast. So we have a fresh root door switch, freezer door switch. Well, where is this auger switch located in the machine? Here is a parts breakdown of the refrigerator. Find me guys my two door switches and my auger switch. I know it's not a perfect picture. You know what? I might have the parts breakdown. Uh no, I, I, I gotta zoom out. It's too big it's too big for me here. Let me see if I have the parts breakdown still open. Um, Should it be in the somewhere in the dispenser? It's not in the dispenser. It's not the switch that the dispenser hits. Let me minimize this one again here. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll bring this bigger. Um, we go to this picture here, and we're gonna make this bigger. The light switches are here in the hinge covers, 93 and 93. They're the same part number, interchangeable. Freezer door, refrigerator door. Remember, this is a side-by-side -side refrigerator, not a top and bottom, okay? But if you look at number 14A here, that's located inside the freezer on the sidewall where most light switches are on the door. So you might have a complaint saying door open and you open up the freezer door and you see this switch inside and you think that is what's telling it's the doors open that is not it would be number 93 up here in the hinge cover 
that one there, number 41, is this auger switch. And notice, these two switches are low voltage. They're on the 5 volt side. This is on the 120 volt side. And this is for the auger motor so that the, the ice can push out through the door. So if you open up the freezer door, they don't want the ice bucket dumping water on the floor. And that's what that door switch is doing. That door switch is located in the wall and it's a safety to prevent the motor from pushing ice out. Any questions on that? I'm not going to go so much from the board. We've already talked about these two switches are on J5, 8 and 12, 7 and 11, so they're all on this one plug right here. But this one's on J3, 1. Can you check this switch from the board? This auger switch? I'll go back to the full diagram if you want to see the full diagram. Can we check this auger switch from the board? Here it is here. One side goes back to the board, what, J31. How would you check that switch? Can you put on the middle? On the middle of what? Between the one and the two? There's nothing there. Remember, that's just a box. It, 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 if there's no number, it's not, it's not even part of the J3 plugged. They're just showing one and two separated. Could I ohm out between pin one and two? No. Let's look at this path here for a second. If I go to one, one's going to come in and go to the auger switch. It's going to go here to the auger motor, and if I go back this way, where does it go? Pin 2. I can ohm it out. If I get no reading, it doesn't mean my switch itself is bad because I'm going through the motor and the sun. All of them are in series. So, yeah, I'm going to probably have about 100, 200, 300 ohms reading, depending on what the solenoid is, and the motor. You add their resistances up. But if the switch is good, I'm going to have a resistance reading. And if I open up the door, I won't have any reading because this switch is going to be open, so my meter being here on the board won't read it. So I can tell if the switch is good, but let's say the auger motor is not pushing ice out the door. Yeah, I can go back and pull the bucket out and get all the way down to that motor. But let me just see if, the, if this switch and the motor has resistance. And then I can open the door and say, oh, I open it and I lose my resistance and I close, I get my resistance. Then I know all of these have continuity. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go to the auger motor, not the switch. But if I don't get a reading, now I have to go down to component level. I have to go to the part. Testing from the board doesn't always tell you what part is bad. It tells you a circuit is good or bad this way. So if you get no reading, it doesn't tell you whether it's this, this, or this, because all three of them in order. What I've been doing in my latest video that I put up on the dryer diagram, if you guys got a chance to see it, was you would take this diagram here and break it up into a straight thing. So I got J31 here, right? And I got this purple and black wire, and it goes to a switch. That's my auger switch. So I, that's this wire right here to that switch. That's what I drew so far. Now coming out that switch, I'm going to the auger motor. So coming out the switch, I'm going to go to a motor. I'm going to call it the auger motor. Now normally that auger motor would go here, which is neutral going out. But it also goes back through this solenoid here and back to the board on J32. So when I'm testing these two here, I'm testing through this switch plus this motor and plus this resist this solenoid. If I got a reading, my door switch, my auger switch is good. My motor is probably good resistance wise. But that's a quick check instead of having to take the whole fridge apart. Now it's not that quick of a check because this board is on the bottom of the fridge underneath the freezer right there. You have to take the grill off and one screw and pull the board out. 
but you can sort of narrow down problems. Now, let's go back to this auger motor not working. Let me go to the other diagram. Oops. Richard, but I can remove that switch, right? <laughs> and just. You what? On and on. I can remove that switch and on and out, right? It should be easy. Yes, you can. Give me one second. I, I Did I accidentally just close my presentation down? And now my presentation won't open up. I did something now and, and messed up my, my presentation, guys. I apologize. I can't even open it up. One second. I have that diagram open someplace else. I, I can't close it. I can't open it. The computer's uh, got me restricted. Um, yeah, that switch is inside that side wall. It's like a like a like a regular light switch on a refrigerator in the plastic. Um, I was at another school in Miami here. Uh, com my students competing against their students. And the guy showed me a refrigerator he was going to use in a contest, but the guys were trying to pull the door switch out, and they tore the plastic liner trying to get that fridge out. That fridge is hard to pull out. So if you could prove that it's good without taking it out, you have less risk of damaging the liner inside the wall of the refrigerator. Um, These, these light switches here, and I apologize guys, I closed it. These light switches right here, this is the type of switch you have in that refrigerator. And you see this little plastic. You need to push down on that to get it out, but this is over top of the plastic liner. And even if you're very careful, sometimes you make a little mark or, or a little notch on the plastic. So if you do not have to pull these out, don't. Okay, I'm just telling you that they can cause problems with the uh, with the unit. Let me get back to my diagram here. I, I lost my presentation, guys. I apologize. So, yes, you you would want to say, hey, I got a reading. This is good. But then I could do another test here. So let's say this this is good, and and the auger motor and the solenoid give me resistance, but the auger motor is still not pushing ice out. So I want to look at this thing and say, well, is the motor good or bad? Just because it has resistance, do, does that mean the part's still good? It could be no. it could be mechanically bad, right? Because that's a gear-driven motor. So what could I do? What what kind of test could I still make down from the board? A voltage test? A voltage test would be a great test. So where would I make my voltage test? The two and the one? No, because they're both going to be power. One's power for for the solenoid, and the other one's power for the motor. So J three one J Q. Oh, what's the neutral? So oh, basically J three one and neutral. Well, J two six. If you look right here, J26 is neutral, this light blue, and Frigidaire uses light blue for all their neutral. It's not going directly back to, there's the neutral here, you see the light blues? And they come here and they go up here to this pin, and they make their way back to the board, or not to the board, but to the plug. But there's another neutral going into the board here on pin 1 on J1. But it's also on this plug, it's also on J3, 9. You could use either one of them for neutral. So you put one meter lead here and one meter lead here, and what are we going to do? Measure the voltage drop. But yeah, but what do you got to do to make perform that voltage test? You put your meter on those two pins. Are you gonna have voltage right now? No, I need to shut the switch. You press the paddle. All right, Peter. Very good. Uh, I I think someone else. Uh, I can't see your name there. It's a pop up. Uh, how do you pronounce your name? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you can just say Essek for short. Essek. Okay. Essek. <laughs> 
Akeseka? Is that how you say Aque it? Aquesica. Aquesica. That's it. I can say that. Aquesica. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, I, I think you said it as well to press. You'd have to activate it by pressing on the dispenser with a cup or something. So you have to um, to send the power there. If the power is not going to go to this auger motor by itself. You're going to put your meter here and here, and then while the door is closed, you're going to put a cup or something there so that the board is sending the power. So if you've got good resistance between two and one, which is telling you, okay, we got continuity in all these, and you've got voltage between, let's say, this pin and this pin, one and nine or one and six here on this plug, either one is fine. They both say neutral, so I can use either one of them. If they're neutral, it's, it's all connected to neutral. So if I got power there and my auger motor still don't work, what are you going to do? Get a new auger motor. It's not the door switch. It's not the board. The board's sending power. So it's got to be a bad auger. And, and that's what it has to be. So guys, um, I came up amongst my hour, I apologize, like last week I went about an hour and 40 minutes and I would have gone longer today but uh, I got some place I got to be at 2 o'clock. I had something come up and I told him I had to wait till after the class and because my presentation here closed and I can't open it, I'm going to have to figure out if I can recover it or get the other half. So next week Saturday, if I can fit it into my schedule, I will send you guys out an email and I'll go over the second half of this. There's a lot more of this schematic and and the board that I want to talk about in testing. Do any of you guys have any specific questions from today's class or have any questions before we, we end class today? Well, since nobody has any questions, I want to make a suggestion. Go to Walmart or your Office Depot or Office Max or one of those office centers or you can, even online, Amazon. Order yourself something called dry erase markers. This is, and I sent some of you guys those books and manuals. Hopefully you'll have a chance to uh, go through some of that material. Like this one here, wow, five bucks for 25 pack. Tamu is horrible so I don't know how good those markers are. For 16 bucks you get 36 of them but make sure they say dry erase markers because what you're going to do is you're going to get a plastic sheet and sometimes people use those I don't know if you've seen sheet protectors where they clip into a notebook and you slide the paper down inside the plastic protectors. You put your schematics inside the sheet protectors and then you see how I, with, with the computer, I draw a line over the circuit and tracing circuits. Use these dry erase markers to practice drawing the circuits and then you can erase them. Where if you use a permanent marker, you'd have to have a hundred copies of the diagram and every time you write on it, you mess up and you have to throw it away. But use these dry erase markers. You could even use them in the field if you're having a hard time tracing a circuit, especially one that has a lot of lines on it, this will help you trace the circuits and follow the circuits along and um, go ahead and, and practice drawing circuits. The more you guys look at these and the more we practice these, the easier it's going to get for you when you're working on product. Some of you have a good uh, understanding of diagrams, I can tell by your responses and everything, and uh, I appreciate all your, all your input. But um, you know, my students will take diagrams home and they say, "I'm going to take this diagram home and I'm going to study this diagram." And they come back on Monday and they say, "Rich, I got this diagram and I sat down and I looked at it, you know, and I don't know what to study." I mean, I'm looking at the diagram, I can see parts, I can see the diagram, I can see switches and stuff, but I don't know how to study a diagram. One of the things you guys want to do is hopefully you have the machine that goes with the diagram. Try to trace each component's 
circuit. If it's a fan motor, how does it get power? How does it get back to the, is it low voltage? Is it 120 volts? Trace those circuits. Because in the last video that I posted over the week here about tracing the circuits and those circuits, knowing what parts are in the circuit for that part, either that part's bad or something in that circuit is bad. And troubleshooting is very hard to walk up to a product you've never seen before. You know this part's not working in the machine, but you're like, I don't know how to troubleshoot it. I don't know where to begin. I know what you guys are thinking. I know how, how it is because remember at one point I was just a student learning how to do this too. And I walk up to the machine with a diagram. I can read the diagram. I can trace the circuits all day. And I go to the machine and I say, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, I didn't know what to do with it. And it's there just to tell us how parts are wired and what switches control those parts. Because if that part failed, either that part's the problem or one of those switches in that circuit's the problem. So you don't have to check every switch in the machine. If you could find the circuit for that one part and that part is not working, then anything in that circuit you just drew, you have to check those and find out which one of them are good or bad. So if you're just good at ohming a switch out, know if a switch is good or bad by testing it, then use that, okay? The more you use it, the more better you, you will get at reading these diagrams and using these diagrams. So if there's any other questions before we sign off, um, I will do the other half of this present. You know what? I think I just figured out what my presentation was. There it is. <laughs> I thought I could close it, but I, it, it was minimized on my screen. didn't realize it. So anyways, I still want to go over the ice maker circuits. I want to go over the compressor circuits some of the sensor circuits as well uh, so it's probably going to be another hour-long presentation uh, so I will try to see if I can squeeze it into my Saturday class and I will I will send you out a messages and thank you very much Peter and if, if you guys don't have any questions I appreciate you and uh, I'll see you again next week and I will invite everybody else to this last class okay